Welcome to today's Transfer Express webinar, How to Create Great T-Shirt Designs That Sell. My name is Andy Curtis. I am the current Senior Manager of Customer Service Graphic Design here at Transfer Express, and whatever other roles they have me doing at this given time. <laughs> I've been with the company for 18 years, and uh, odds are if you've been to a Transfer Express webinar, you've probably joined me before, so welcome back. Um, if you have not been to a Transfer Express webinar before, then welcome, friend. Thank you for joining us. Um, the way this is going to play out is that we are going to talk for about 30 to 45-ish minutes. Uh, we are going to uh, have the slides going here. If you have any questions as we go, please pop them into the chat box there. Uh, we are recording the webinar, as always, and the with the slides of the webinar, too. Um, and a little uh, little uh, asterisk right here at the beginning, just to let everybody know. If you've joined me before, you know that my slides tend to be usually a little bit picture heavy and not quite so wordy. The topic today is a little bit more wordy. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, I am not going to read every single word uh, of these slides off to you. Uh, I'm going to sort of chat with you about what each slide says. So I encourage you that if this is a topic you do want to really dive into, uh, do go back and read word for word the info on the slides too. Um, okay, so with that being said, we are going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Um, we're going to talk about a couple different things today. First of all, we're going to talk about where to get your inspiration for designs from, where to get designs from. We're going to talk about what programs to use. We're going to go over vector and bitmap and what all those things mean and what's better. We're going to talk about file types, too. And then we're going to talk about how to prepare artwork for heat transfers. So we're going to be covering a whole bunch of topics here today. We're, we're going from creative to practical and a little bit of artwork. And we're going to talk about creating successful artwork or creating art that sells. Let's talk about the T-shirt for a second here, okay? So T-shirts are a blank canvas. For the past 50 years, the graphic tee has been a wardrobe staple. Now, the funny thing for me, if you've joined me before, you might know that I am, however, that wearing a t-shirt just as your main means of garment has become acceptable, uh, originally having been undergarments, as I said. So for the coming up with something that's going to cross over and be popular across the board, Right. So on my slide here, I've got a couple examples of that. We all remember when that keep calm and carry on thing happened. Right. I mean, those T-shirts were all over the place. Uh, so the point I was making here is that T-shirts are walking billboards. Right. T-shirts are a staple. They've been a staple for about 50 years now. The history of the T-shirt goes way back. They were originally underwear. So it's funny, the evolution of fashion and the evolution of our, our uh, industry, uh, the garment decoration industry and all that. Um, to think that it's really just the last 50 years that t-shirts have become socially acceptable to use as actual general garments, even, you know, I, before when they were undergarments. So it's, it's kind of funny to think of it that way. But either way, uh, the point that I was making here is that we see t-shirts of all kinds out there. You, you see all kinds of wacky, weird designs and stuff. The hitch that we all have to ask ourselves is what's the design that's going to cross over? Like it's, it's all well and cool to come up with something creative and put something on a t-shirt and all, but what's going to sell? What's going to get people's uh, attention? What's going to get people to, um, what's going to get people to uh, actually buy, you know? So uh, my favorite example on this slide is actually the keep calm and carry on. Um, so I, the funny thing for me, I, I, I don't know if anybody else out there when, uh, do you guys remember when the keep calm and carry on thing happened and with those t-shirts were just all over the place. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing somebody wearing a keep calm and carry on t-shirt. Um, those were all over the place. And most recently, uh, the, uh, I didn't put the picture up on the slide, but the straight out of t-shirts, uh, where it's straight out of this or straight out of that, straight out of this place. So those, those have been all over the place too. So the whole point is we ask ourselves, okay, well, beyond just putting my art on a shirt, uh, what, what design is going to cross over and sell? So when you're a t-shirt designer, when you're somebody who's trying to sell t-shirts, where do you get your inspiration from? Where does the inspiration come from? Where do you get your ideas from? So I, I have a quote here. I, I love this quote. The t-shirt is a really basic way of telling the world who and what you are. 
tell me that's not a, a beautiful way of looking at it, right? Like that's that's totally true to our industry. Um, so uh, t-shirts are a means to convey a message. When creating designs, keep in mind what idea needs to be conveyed. Whether for fashion or to convey a specific message or brand, a good design always starts with a clear plan. So this is one of those things that it sounds it sounds like common sense, but when you're coming up with a design, when you have an idea for something, you have to ask yourself, what is the message that I am trying to send? What's the message that I'm trying to get across to everybody? Is what I'm doing functional? Is it fashion? Is it edgy? Is it something that I'm trying to make some kind of statement? Is it political? Is it creative? So this is one of those things that uh, you have to ask yourself. Um, you have to ask yourself what your point is that you're trying to get across. So, uh, for example, when you're doing T-shirts for a bank, that's going to look different than T-shirts for an elementary school. If you're doing something that's supposed to be edgy, that's going to look different than something that's just your classic business design. So at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves what the point is of what we're trying to get across. What are you trying to communicate? And that helps to frame what you do with your design, what colors you use, what fonts you use. We, and this is one of those things where uh, we can get into the psychology of this, and this can be a really long conversation, this one slide in and, of, in and of itself, right? You can get into the psychology of what different fonts say, the way they look, and how that communicates. For example, uh, Comic Sans. We all have seen Comic Sans, right? Well, does everybody out there, anybody out there, do you guys know what the, uh, what the, um, sort of the meaning behind Comic Sans is? Do you guys know what uh, the public view of Comic Sans is? Comic Sans is one of those fonts that's kind of a joke, right? Like, people don't take Comic Sans very seriously. So, if you put together a design, and maybe Comic Sans looks good because the shape of the text and the shape of the font goes with the design that you've... <laughs> I hate Comic Sans. See? Um... Comic Sans is one of those fonts that's actually sort of a joke, and people see Comic Sans and they don't tend to take it seriously. So even if you have a design where Comic Sans looks correct, people might not take your design seriously because you've chosen to use that font that you can find jokes and memes on the internet about Comic Sans, right? Comic, cartoon, ex well, yeah, exactly, Pedro. Um, it's, a, it's a cartoony font, and... Uh, <laughs> Fitting that I cut out at Comic Sans. There you go. Um, Comic Sans is a font that people don't take seriously because it's cartoony. It's one of those fonts that was around way back at the beginning of word processors once upon a time. So the point is that when you use Comic Sans, what message does that send to the people who see it? What message does that send to the people who are your target audience? So it's the same thing in general when you're designing a t-shirt, when you're looking for your inspiration, what does all of it say together? The font that you use, the graphics that you use, the colors that you use. And the photograph here is absolutely hilarious. Minnie Mouse uh, pointing at a dead mouse t-shirt. That's hilarious. <laughs> So again, uh, the idea here is to, when you're looking for your inspiration, when you're trying to put your, your t-shirt together, your grand idea, ask yourself what all the elements say. Look into the psychology of it and ask yourself, what, what message am I sending? What message am I trying to send? So continuing this idea of where to find inspiration, um, once you've got the general idea of what kind of design you'll be making, it's time for the creative juices to flow. The internet is obviously a great place to start, but you'll have to be careful about copyright infringement. Um, so if you guys joined me last month, we had probably one of the biggest webinars we have ever had last month, and it was about copyrights and copyright infringement and how to get around copyrights and how to avoid copyright and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that is a whole 45, 
to a 60 minute topic in and of itself. But the whole point is once you've got your idea down, once you, you know, okay, I know what I'm trying to say, I know what I'm trying to convey with my design, and I'm gonna start putting my design together, be wary of copyright infringement. You gotta be careful that you're not uh, you're not copying anybody else's stuff. You want to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position that you're going to get uh, any cease and desist letters from anybody's lawyers. Um, you might be trying to rip off a logo or, or do a parody of some kind of some kind of logo. Just be careful. The whole idea is that you don't want to put all of your work and time into a design only to be told by the lawyers that you're not allowed to print it. Um, save a P Pinterest board with images you like or that you think others would like, even ones that you see all over the place, because it helps to keep things in one place and see what patterns emerge. So if you're putting together, this is a great idea, and I've, I've heard our marketing team do this before. When you're trying to put together an idea for a shirt, when you're trying to put together the concept of maybe it's even a line of t-shirts, a series of t-shirts you're going to do, the whole idea is put together a Pinterest board, pin ideas that inspire you and that uh, jive with what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you see some people do this with uh, inspiration boards too. Uh, I, I have uh, coworkers who have uh, bulletin boards in their offices that are meant to be inspiration boards and they put things on them that inspire them. Me personally, as a customer service person, I have a bulletin board here in my office that I have a whole bunch of inspirational sayings and stuff on too. So if you're going to design t-shirts, if that's your thing, then put together a Pinterest board or a bulletin board or some kind of idea board where you put together your ideas, your visuals. Remember at the end of the day, even if you're a concept person, you're sort of a, a pie in the sky, a big picture thinker, remember that at the end of the day, what you're doing, creating a t-shirt is a visual thing. A t-shirt is essentially a billboard that people wear. So um, the whole idea here is to put together visual ideas of what get your creative juices flowing. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, the whole point here is that once you've got your ideas, once you know what you're going to be doing, start assembling it into an actual design, start putting your ideas together and see what kind of, see what kind of patterns emerge in all of your ideas, right? So what programs do you use? What, what, what program do I do this in? I've got my idea. I know what kind of t-shirt I want to put together. I know what my design should look like, but how do I put it together? What do I do? So at the end of the day, there are a ton of different software packages and programs out there to use. Um, and there's a bunch of different directions you can go with this. Uh, obviously, one of the more popular systems out there is Adobe, Photoshop, and Illustrator. Uh, those are super easy uh, to get a hold of, um, but if you're going to buy it properly, it is a little bit pricey, and it is a little bit of a learning curve to learn the Adobe uh, suite of products. Uh, it does take a little bit of time. It's one of those things where you're you're not just going to buy Adobe and just jump right into it and be an expert right off the bat. There's time and energy that have to go into learning and understanding the Adobe products. Um, and then, of course, the primary competitor in our industry, if you're not using Adobe, you're probably using Corel Draw. Uh, Corel Draw perhaps uh, not used quite as much as Adobe, so there's the hitch with Corel is you don't see nearly as many people using Corel uh, as you do the Adobe products, but uh, Adobe has a home and a student edition. They're available at a lower price. Um, back in the day uh, when we were at the beginning of our journey here at Transfer Express, Corel Draw was the program that was more adaptable and customizable. So we have used Corel Draw for the last 20 some years here at Transfer Express because we were able to program Corel and we were able to customize the program to do what we needed to do here at Transfer Express. So if you're gonna ask us what our opinion is for the best program, we're gonna tell you that we prefer Corel here. But of course you don't have to use Corel. Um, any, good, any good company that you work with should be able to take just about any file type. And we're gonna talk about file types more in just a second here. But um, at the end of the day, it's expensive either way to go with Cor uh, Corel or Adobe because you have to purchase the program and that can be a little bit pricey, even though Corel does have the cheaper versions of it. So then you've got websites like Canva or Placeit uh, where they've got great options, but those are 
based on template designs. And you see a, a couple other websites, Canva and Placeit are just two examples. Um, you'll see a couple different websites out there that have design platforms like that, that, okay, they, they are easy to get moving on and they're easy to get your creative juices flowing and put some ideas together, but then, you know, they're not advanced enough for you to really totally get your, your vision to come to fruition. So it's kind of a trade off. Um, <laughs> and per the meme that I have on my slide here. Um, oh, Gimp, there you go. There's another one. Yep. Um, and per the uh, meme on my slide here, I, I thought this was so funny. I had to, I had to include this. Uh, if you're, if you know, you know, <laughs> right? Um, the uh, rivalry in our industry between Adobe and Corel, right? Uh, I'm sure if I pulled the whole room to see who prefers what, I'm sure it would be uh, pretty well divided. So. Um, aside from Adobe and Corel, we also have our uh, program that we have made here at Transfer Express called EasyView. So our EasyView online designer is also a great resource for heat transfer design because it was built exactly for that purpose. The whole point of EasyView was for you to have access to a program that is similar to sort of like Corel Draw Junior. Um, but on our website. So you didn't have to purchase the program package. It's easy to access, it's easy to get to. Oh, there you go, Dustin, I use Corel. Well, good for you, Dustin, so do we. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, easy view designer that we've created though is made with the purpose of creating transfers in mind. So we've put together a designer that is made to cater to your purposes. Um, and don't forget that even if you do have your own custom artwork, our EasyView Online Designer is also filled with a whole bunch of stock artwork, pre-made designs. So if you have a customer that comes into you with a rough idea of a concept of a baseball jersey or a football jersey, but they don't have a real set in stone design, we got your back there. We've got all the pre-made designs where you can pull something up and put something together for them. Um, it is a helpful tip though, uh, it's helpful, uh, with easy view uh, to remember that although the artwork is prepared for heat transfers, there are still artwork guidelines required for a correct print. So if you're going to use easy view to create transfers, something that you do want to remember is that you have to be careful of sizing. Um, we have this happen periodically where people will put together, especially now that masks are a thing. Now that people are decorating masks left, right, and center, um, we see this happen all the time where somebody will take a design that they put together for like the front of a t-shirt or something and they'll just shrink it down tiny to fit on a mask. Now, and unfortunately it kind of doesn't work that way. Um, if you have a design like the one in my picture here, this Panthers design that's in my picture, this looks great at the size that it is on that computer screen because it's full size. But if you took that design and shrunk it down to fit on the front of a mask, see all those tiny details in the word Panther and the two stars next to the Panther's head and the text underneath of it, the land and football. Um, that's all of that is gonna close up on itself. When you press a transfer, you have to remember that when you press a transfer, ink expands and closes up small areas. So when you're planning your design, when you're doing something small, remember that you don't wanna to go too small because when you press transfers, ink expands, closes up small areas. And that's not, uh, not helpful, not helpful. Michael asks, uh, what do you think about layer cake for Photoshop? You know what, I, I am not familiar with layer cake, to be honest with you, Michael, um, since we don't use Photoshop here at Transfer Express, I, I can honestly tell you, I am, I am not familiar with that. Um, I have heard uh, of some of our uh, college kid that work for us uh, talking about a whole bunch of other different programs, but that one's, that one's new, I don't know that one. So, the next thing as we go here, so you, you've got your design, you've figured out what you want to put together in terms of your design. You have decided what program you're going to use. So one of the challenges we have is, do I create my design in vector? Necessarily know what the difference between vector and bitmap is. So let's talk about that for just a second here. Um, so grabbing the nodes and moving the nodes around. It's mathematically a squiggly line. A bitmap, on the other hand, like you see on the left-hand side of my picture here, a bitmap is made of pixels. 
it's not an actual, it's value though, because if you look at my two squiggly lines here, if you're trying to make a squiggly line that is a little bit more hand-drawn looking, faded out, uh, where it's got that sort of uh, ink spreading look to it, the bitmap does look like that. It looks like paint, honestly, right? The vector, on the other hand, is a nice solid line. So there, there are pluses and uh, minuses to both types of artwork, bitmap and vector. Um, so it's one of those things where you need to ask yourself what exactly you're trying to create uh, and what exactly you're trying to do. So generally speaking, from our point of view, vector is the preferred format for transfer artwork, especially for screen printed transfers. Okay, What we want to see is vector because that's what we're going to use. Um, uh, but uh, the bitmaps, on the other hand, bitmaps, there is a time and a place for bitmaps. Uh, faded artwork, photographic artwork, very detailed artwork with lots of colors. Bitmaps definitely shine in that pr particular perspective. Um, so at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself what you're creating and what you're trying to do. Um, and then use whichever type of artwork is beneficial to you. If you're putting together a piece of artwork that is not faded and shaded and a whole bunch of photographic colors, then go with Vector. Vector will serve you better at that point. Plus uh, the added benefit of Vector artwork being able to click and resize and drag and edit the artwork more easily. If you have artwork that is uh, a photograph in, in some nature uh, or Maybe it is actually a photograph. Maybe you're doing a picture of grandma on a t-shirt. In that case, yeah, you're going to want to use bitmap artwork. You're not going to want to try to convert bitmap to vector at that point. Um, it is possible to convert between these two to go from bitmap to vector. Uh, but you got to remember that that really only works with simple artwork that does not have a lot of colors. If you try to convert something that is a very colorful bitmap over to vector, it's not going to work well because it, the program has to take all of those different colors and try to turn them into shapes that have a solid boundary. But you see how in our bitmap example here, there really is no solid boundary. It kind of fades out. So therein lies the sort of the problem between vector and bitmap. Uh, now, you can also have the best of both worlds by combining them, and that's what we've done here in these two examples. Uh, this works really well really well for trendy graphics, uh, or anytime your client has a full color logo with lots of colors. Uh, just make sure that any part of the design that you create that is a bitmap is a 300 resolution and that it's sized correctly. This is the most important part of working with bitmaps make sure your resolution is 300. And again, resolution is the numeric value, the quality of your artwork. If you have a low resolution, like 72, that's a low quality piece of artwork. The higher the number, the better the quality. So 300 resolution. And then if you're sending me a bitmap and you want that bitmap printed, uh, if you send me that bitmap at two inches by two inches, but then you tell me to blow it up to 10 by 10, well, okay, that's going to sacrifice some of that quality. Vector artwork, you can change the size. Vector, you can shrink and enlarge and shrink and enlarge, and it always looks true to what it's supposed to be uh, because it's been made mathematically. A bitmap, though, is made of pixels. Pixels don't change in size. You can make pixels larger, but they don't clarify. So what happens is when you take a piece of bitmap artwork that's two by two and you blow it up to 10 by 10, it gets pixelated, meaning it gets fuzzy and blurry. We've all seen pictures like that, right? Where you take a picture on a low quality camera and then you try to blow the picture up, but everybody is really super, um, everybody is super uh, um, pixelated and fuzzy and you can't really see very well. Um, so the whole idea here is you want to make sure that your bitmaps are 300 resolution or higher, and you want to make sure that they are the correct size as well. Now, for what it's worth, when you do have uh, this particular type of situation where you've got vector and bitmap artwork, we do suggest using our ultra color transfers in this particular case. You wouldn't want to go with our traditional screen print stuff because you've got your full color artwork there in both of these examples. So you would go with our ultra color, which is a hybrid of full color digital art that sits on top of a bed of screen printing. So sort of a best of both worlds situation. 
All right, so you've created your design. Now, how do you get it on apparel? So depending on what program you're using, there are several ways. So if you used our EasyView online designer, um, then you just go ahead and place the order and we process it. Just keep in mind uh, that our artwork guidelines have to be met. So 0 0.04 inches for show through areas, 0 0.012 for printed thickness. Um, if you've created your program, your artwork using a different program, you want to keep several things in mind before sending the artwork out to print. Uh, make sure that any text is converted to curves or outlines, uh, which means that when it's opened on another computer, the text will be viewable. Um, so the whole idea is if you, uh, if you use a font that you have on your computer and I don't have it on my computer, when I try to open that file up, I'm not going to see your font because I don't have that font loaded on my computer. If you take your artwork and uh, convert it to curves, if you're using Corel Draw, or with uh, the Adobe products, it's called convert to outlines. When you convert it, the program doesn't look like uh, doesn't look at it like it's a font anymore. It treats it like it's just a piece of artwork. So then, when I open it on my side, I will see the font that you chose. Okay, so if you're preparing artwork to be printed, that's something to keep in mind is that you want to convert all of your text to curves. Okay, and then uh, regardless, if you're using our EasyView online designer or if you're using uh, your own program, there are still minimum printing guidelines. So any line for screen print artwork, any line that you want to print, whether it's a piece of text or it's a piece of artwork, any printed area needs to be 0 0.012 inches thick. And then any show through area, meaning the spaces in between letters or in between pieces of artwork, the space around things needs to be 0 0.04 inches thick. All right, ensuring that you have the proper color mode for your print method will help you get expected results. Uh, screen printed artwork uses placeholder colors or spot colors. So uh, that means that the color in the file is not what ends up being printed, right? So a uh, spot color basically means that um, I'm plugging that color in right where it shows, kind of like a coloring book, right? Um, so uh, for example, um, if I'm printing uh, an apple uh, via screen print, then I'm just going to have a red apple. I'm going to print red for the apple. I'm going to print brown for the stem, and I'm going to print green for the leaf. And that's how I'm going to print my apple. That's three colors. I'm using three different colors that come out of a bucket and go into those spots just like a coloring book does. Now, on the other hand, when you're doing full color artwork, uh, full color artwork is uh, presented in one of two ways. Uh, you can do CMYK or you can do RGB. So we here at Transfer Express, we print in the CMYK color mode, okay? And CMYK, again, stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, black. Uh, that basically means that every color of the spectrum is made by combining those four colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, so CMYK is used for full color artwork. And it's very different. So the whole point is that uh, CMYK is obviously any color of the spectrum. You can print the entire rainbow of colors using CMYK. When you're using spot colors, you could print every color of the rainbow, but remember with spot colors, the more colors you use, the more you're going to pay because we have to burn a screen for every single color you choose. So for example, if you were printing an actual rainbow, you'd have a red screen, an orange screen, a yellow screen, a green screen, a blue screen, so on and so forth. So if you do digital transfers, if you do uh, digital artwork using the CMYK process, you can have the whole range of colors, right? Now, in this case, we're not screen printing, we're using a digital transfer instead. Um, so it's not screen print, but then it doesn't matter how many colors you use because it's printing digitally. We're using the CMYK process. Now it's worth noting uh, that both uh, both of these formats are found in art programs. So whether you're using Corel or you're using Adobe or, or any other art program, RGB and CMYK both tend to be available. Uh, it is not a clean conversion between the two because you see that the colors do look different actually. So if you send us artwork in RGB 
and we're going to print it here at Transfer Express. It prints in CMYK, and what ends up happening is the colors do shift slightly because it's not a clean conversion between the two. So the colors shift just a little bit and can change just a tiny bit. Sometimes purples look a little blue, sometimes yellows look a little brown, so on and so forth. Uh, so you want to make sure before you send artwork, um, not just to Transfer Express, but to any printer, anybody you work with, find out if they work in CMYK or RGB so you can make sure that you send them uh, the correct type of art file. Image file types can be a little bit confusing at first, but there are a few guidelines to make this easier. Vector formats are usually saved as .eps or .pdf. Okay, so generally speaking, most computers can handle opening a PDF, but not all computers can handle opening an EPS. So PDF files are usually the safest bet. PDF files are the file type that sort of tends to be the universal norm when you're talking about vector artwork. And that's the last couple of years here. Obviously, that's changed a little bit over the years. But here recently, you see more people turning to PDF because it's easier to send vector artwork through a PDF. Now, there's other file formats also, obviously. There's .ai files, .cdr files that are also vector. Um, a vector file is a vector file. And from a Transfer Express perspective, we'll accept whatever you have. But talking about how to interact with the rest of our industry and how our industry as a whole functions, PDFs do tend to be the norm for most people when you're trying to convey vector formatted artwork. For bitmaps, this one's kind of a toss up. .tiff, a TIFF file, is best uh, suited for printing. However, the same situation uh, can be said where not all computers can handle all those different file types. Uh, so you can use PDF also for bitmaps, or you can use .jpg, JPEGs, or .bmps. You've got .png as well. So bitmaps, there are a ton of different file types out there. At the end of the day, when you're sending bitmap artwork, the file type is not as consequential as ensuring what we've talked about on the past slides, that you've got a good high resolution, 300 or more, and that you've sized your artwork correctly. So you want to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, you, you're sending over a high quality bitmap, regardless of which one of these file types that you choose. Once you do get to this point, TIFF, TIFF, is the one that works best for printing, but if you can't get a TIFF, it's totally okay. JPEGs work, PNGs work, GIFs work, all that kind of stuff, not a problem. Okay, so preparing artwork, just a couple other rules of thumb here. So uh, considering what color placement, um, consider the color placement that you're going to be putting stuff on. So what looks good on a light garment might not look good on a dark garment. As you can see in our example here, this piece of artwork for uh, Compton Pirates, when you're looking at it on a white background and then you just invert it so it's exactly the same thing but flipped for the other color. Uh, so let's start on the left here. On the left you see black ink for Compton Pirates. You see black ink on a white square. Looks good. I'm going to take that same artwork and just make it white and then make my square black. Looks kind of funky, right? Because now my skull is black and my hat is white. That doesn't look quite as good. So if I'm putting it on a black background, you see my third square there shows you what does look good. The text can be white and the shadow for the text can be white. That's all fine. But my skull really should be white, right? And so should the swords. And then the hat should be show through to the black. So the whole point here is when you put a design together, if you're going to put that same design on multiple color shirts, make sure to be strategic about it. That same design might not look good in a different color on a different shirt. It's best to get that visual and actually see it. Make sure you look at it, don't just assume. A couple other little tidbits too. Uh, something that we see here at Transfer Express, don't don't do script fonts in all uppercase. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. It doesn't look good. Uh, you see my first square there on the bottom row where it says Hamden Knights, the word Knights. We've got an all uppercase script. 
Obviously, you can read it. It looks funky, though. Not a good idea. Um, number two, keep your design elements proportionate, not squished. So this is one of those things that does happen on occasion where people will get sort of stuck on a size that they want. Go, well, it has to be 11 by 6. It has to be 11 by 6. It has to be 11 by 6. Okay, well, the design you put together might not look good 11 by 6. Don't get stuck on that size. Let your artwork be proportionate. If the design that you created is a rectangle, then that design's a rectangle. It's never going to be a square. Uh, people will send a piece of artwork to us that is very clearly a rectangle, like the Hamden Knights that you see there, for example. Somebody will send us a piece of artwork like that and say, but I want it to be exactly 11 by 11. Well, it can't be 11 by 11 because this design is wider than it is tall. So it's never going to actually be equal on both sides. It's not going to be 11 by 11. It's going to be 11 by 5 or 11 by 6 or whatever it is. So um, this is one of those things where if your customer has expectations, you got to communicate that kind of stuff out and you got to talk it out. Just because your customer says 11 by 11 and then they give you a rectangular piece of artwork, well, don't stretch that rectangle out. It's it's not going to be 11 by 11. Uh, yeah, Anita, actually, there are standard sizes out there. Uh, we do have um, standard sizes uh, listed on our website. Um, I will let my helper behind the uh, curtain uh, pop that URL to you if uh, he could. That would be super helpful. Um, but yes, there are standard sizes to work with. Um, and then uh, one of the other things that uh, we talk about, too, is making sure that you add outlines to make design elements stand out. So in my last example here on that bottom row, you've got uh, the word softball. You can clearly see it. But <laughs> the funny part is the word Compton is supposed to be up there. Um, and then there's supposed to be text below the word softball as well. But you don't see it very well because it's red on red. So the whole point is you add that show through outline. And that's what that's called. There is a show through outline. Um, and that show through outline around the text makes it so that I can have that red text on that red splatter and it shows up and it looks good. Okay, everybody, I am so sorry that we had the tech problems that we did. Uh, rest assured that we will have them figured out for next month, I promise. Um, I apologize if uh, your audio was going in and out, but uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this was kind of a quick one um, since uh, we didn't have, um, since uh, audio is being weird, we sort of uh, got through the webinar a little quicker than normal. But I encourage all of you, uh, if you have any further questions or you want to talk about this at all, do definitely shoot us an email, info at transferexpress.com. Our customer service reps will be happy to talk to you about any questions that you may have. Definitely hit our blog, blog.transferexpress.com. Our blog is award-winning in our industry and uh, has been celebrated in the past. So please do check our blog out. Our marketing department works so hard on that and keeps everything fresh and up to date. Um, lots of interesting ideas and concepts out there. And then uh, this webinar, as well as all of our past webinars, are at www.transferexpress.com backslash webinars. Earlier, I had mentioned about our webinar that we did last month on copyrights, which was a ton of information, a ton of information about copyrights. So I encourage you to <laughs> go check that out and go uh, watch that webinar for sure. Um, thank you all for sticking around. Thank you, everybody who hung out and uh, uh, stuck, a, uh, stuck around despite the tech issues. I'm so sorry about that. That throws me off. <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody, for coming today, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a good one.